And other people have, have noticed, hey, you can actually do this now in a, in a cell phone. And so they're starting to develop this. And, it, and perhaps they'll be more efficient than we were and won't take six years. But uh, we do have a jump on the market because we were able to anticipate where technology would be several years hence. And th the world changes now quite dramatically. I mean, 2002, six years ago, most people didn't use search engines. I mean, imagine life without search engines. That sounds like ancient history. That was only six years ago. So the pace of change is accelerating. And in fact, I've measured this. It's doubling every decade. Uh, the telephone took 50 years to be adopted by a quarter of the US population. Cell phone did that in seven years. Telephone, radio, television, they, those technologies took decades to be adopted by a mass audience, a quarter of the population. Cell phone, mobile phone, the web did that in just a few years' time. And I have a whole theory on evolution as to why this is the case. And I don't have time to describe it in detail, but basically evolution evolves a capability, adopts that capability, and so the next stage goes more quickly. It took a billion, this is a double logarithmic graph on the x-axis, it's how many years ago this particular paradigm shift took place in powers of 10. On the y-axis, how many years it took for that paradigm shift to be adopted in powers of 10. So the first paradigm shift, basically the evolution of DNA and information backbone that could guide evolution, took a billion years. But then biological evolution used it ever since. So the next stage, the, the Cambrian explosion, went 100 times faster, took only 10 million years. And biological evolution kept accelerating. Homo sapiens evolved in only a few hundred thousand years, really a blink of an eye in biological evolutionary terms. And there's actually only three simple genetic changes that distinguish us from our primate ancestors. We have a larger skull to incorporate a bigger brain. More of the brain's devoted to the cerebral cortex, so we can do abstract reasoning. Uh, we can do what-if experiments in our mind. What if I took that stone and that stick and tied them together? I could extend my leverage. And we have an opposable appendage that actually works well. Other primates actually are not designed very well. They don't have a power grip. They don't have fine motor coordination. We really could change the world. And then we always use the latest technology to create the next. So the first stage of technology, stone tools, wheel, fire, took tens of thousands of years a little bit faster than the hundreds of thousands of years it took to evolve our species. And then technology has evolved uh, ever since. Now, some people criticized this and said, well, curves will only put points on the graph if they fit on the straight line. So I took 15 different lists, including Carl Sagan's Cosmic Calendar, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, American Museum of Natural History, a dozen other lists. And there is some disagreement, but there's a very clear trend line uh, Nobody thinks the internet took a million years. The Cam Nobody thinks the Cameron explosion took 10 years. Uh, there's a very, you know, not much happened in a million years, a billion years ago. There's been a clear acceleration in both biological and technological evolution, with the technological evolution emerging smoothly from the biological evolution that created the technolo technology creating species. And people think linearly, and I think that's hardwired when we were walking through the savannah. Uh, thousands of years ago, uh, we saw something coming at us through the corner of our eye. We made a linear projection where that would be uh, in, a, in 20 seconds, and that served our purposes quite well. Uh, so we actually have predictors. That's what intelligence is all about, built into our brain, but they're linear. Uh, but in fact, uh, technology progress, particularly when it has to do with information, is exponential. And there's quite a difference. They actually look the same. They are, they are confused early on. In fact, exponential growth can be sublinear for a while, but ultimately it diverges quite radically. And information technology is doubling now in less than a year. Uh, here I put 49 famous computers on this graph going back to the 1890 census through five different paradigms. Moore's law is not equivalent to this progression. That's the fifth paradigm to bring exponential growth to computing. Uh, there was four before that. Uh, we, electromechanical calculators, really based computers, vacuum tubes. And another objection to these ideas, which, which Jill alluded to earlier, is that every exponential runs out of steam, it runs out of resources. And that's true. These specific paradigms run out of resources, but what happens is that creates research pressure to create the next paradigm. So in the 50s, they were shrinking vacuum tubes, every year making them smaller and smaller to keep this going. That ran out of steam. They couldn't shrink the vacuum tubes anymore and keep the vacuum, and that was the end of the shrinking of vacuum tubes. It was not the end of the exponential growth of computing. We went to the fourth paradigm. And then the fifth, which was Moore's law, the shrinking of, of sizes on an integrated circuit, 
There have been regular predictions that that was going to come to an end. Uh, in, the first predictions by Gordon Moore himself was 2002. Uh, Intel now says 2022. By that time, the key features will be 4 nanometers, about 20 carbon atoms. We won't be able to shrink them anymore. And that will be the end of Moore's law, but that won't be the end of this exponential growth of computing. We'll go to the sixth paradigm, three-dimensional molecular computing. That was a radical suggestion when I wrote about it in my 1999 book, The Age of Virtual Machines. It's now very much a mainstream view if you talk to the Intel scientists. And uh, I mean, look, look at this progression here of transistor prices. Uh, I mean, this, this represents billions fold of price performance improvement on this logarithmic graph. But what's even more amazing, uh, I mean, we went from one transistor for a dollar to, uh, to 10 million per dollar in, in 19, uh, 2002. It's now 300 million per dollar. But look at how predictable and smooth and inexorable a progression that is. Now, it looks like it's the output of some tabletop experiment or some government mandated program. But this is actually. <laughs> The result of the innovation and competition of all of you and, and uh, millions of other people around the world, and it produces this very predictable progression. And as we've made them cheaper, they're actually faster. So the cost of a transistor cycle has come down by half. Uh, so that's actually 50% deflation for electronics. It's also true of every form of information, whether you're talking about genetic sequencing or brain data. Uh, no matter if you can measure the information content, it has a 50% deflation rate. That is, in fact, what's keeping inflation in check. And the economists worry about deflation. You know, if we have 50% deflation and ultimately the whole economy will be information, we're going to have massive shrinking of the economy because people aren't going to double their consumption year after year. But actually, we more than double our consumption. We've had 18% growth in constant dollars for every form of information technology for the last 50 years, despite the fact that you can get more of it every year, uh, for twice as much every year for the same amount of money. And the reason is, as price performance reaches certain levels, whole new applications explode on the landscape, like, like going to the moon or any other application. People didn't buy iPods for $10,000, which is what it would have cost 15 years ago. And tomorrow, this is a good place for me to stop. I will talk about how this actually applies to reprogramming our bodies and the outdated software that we walk around with. We're not stuck with it. We can actually turn genes off. We can add new genes. We can reprogram who we are, not just for babies, but, but what I'm much more interested in is reprogramming the software for baby boomers. And, uh, and this will be a mature technology 10 or 15 years from now. Uh, and we'll, we've been adding three months a year to human life expectancy, but that's going to go into high gear uh, when we get to the mature phase of this biotechnology revolution. And that will then lead to the nanotechnology revolution, which will provide us even more powerful tools. Thank you very much.